A, uh, I read about a, uh, a German driver that was given a, issued a speeding ticket via camera, kind of like the van cams that we had a few years ago. Those were really popular, weren't they? Uh, and, uh, but I guess they have those in, in Germany and yeah, actually locked in on poles and permanent places. This guy got a ticket for, uh, for speeding. Then he, he appealed the ticket when he explained that he, in fact, was speeding, but he was on his way to the hospital because his wife was very pregnant, about ready to give birth. Uh, the court then ruled and declared him to be innocent and then sent him uh, a, um, I don't know where they got it, but they sent him a doll of a German policeman holding a video camera uh, and, uh, and, and they dismissed the charges. Uh, again, for them, motive meant more than breaking the law at that point, right or wrong legally, that was their decision. Uh, in very much the same way, Jesus is now, as we continue the Sermon on the Mount, that has all been about the fact that our righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees and the scribes if we're going to enter the kingdom of heaven, which he said would have been kind of a bombshell for these guys, given the fact that within Judaism, they had a little saying that said, if only two people got to heaven, it would be a Pharisee and a scribe. So uh, these guys here, uh, Peter and the boys, having freshly been called to, to follow Jesus, are trying to, I'm sure their heads were reeling with all of this uh, teaching that Jesus was giving on his own authority, not quoting other rabbinical teachers, but teaching with authority. You've heard it said in the past, but I tell you, uh, speaking for himself with authority. As he goes through this, as we saw last week, he's very concerned that we let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and be really proud of us and what we've done. No, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now he's going to basically expand on that and give some very, very pointed illustrations in terms of what he's talking about. Uh, verse 1 is kind of a summary statement. It says, uh, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father uh, in heaven. And uh, uh, so this is the summary statement. Uh, we have to be careful. And when Jesus says to be careful about something, it's because we need to be careful. <laughs> when the Bible says you should be warned in this area, it's because we need to be warned. Because it's our tendency to be seen by men, to want to be seen by, by men. Uh, it's, it's like if we ever do anything good, accomplish anything good, we... <laughs> you want others to, uh, to know about it. I, uh, I, I lived on the Big Island for uh, a, a bit, <laughs> several decades ago, and, I, and uh, I was still surfing a lot at the time, but it just wasn't the same, surfing by yourself. Uh, you know, you'd get the good wave and you'd kind of kick out, but you're the only one that knew. It's like, yeah, that was fun. You know, but, you know, normally you're with your buddies, and when you kick out, you're kind of looking did, okay, did anyone see that, you know, <laughs> when something good happened uh, in the water? And if they didn't, it's like, ah, you know, it's just not quite the same thing. Uh, it's our tendency to want to be seen by men, whether it's something athletically we do, uh, something we do academically, something at work or, or, or whatever. We want to be seen by men. And it's true, certainly spiritually as well. And Jesus says to be very careful uh, about these things. Uh, and the background here is uh, important as well, as he uh, gets into dealing with teaching his disciples, but warning about something they would be very familiar with. When the uh, rabbinical teachers, the, the Pharisees themselves, uh, they, would, uh, they would memorize one of, oh, excuse me, they would memorize 18, not one of, they would have at least 18 very beautiful, very lengthy prayers that they would memorize. And they loved to stand in the synagogue and then recite these prayers. 
These guys were brilliant men. They were brilliant scholars, as we've said in the past, uh, having most or major portions of the Old Testament completely memorized. They just didn't have it memorized. They could tell you the middle, the middle verse of the book of Psalms. They could tell you the middle verse and the middle word in the book of Deuteronomy. They could t- I mean, they, mathematically, they had all these schemes worked out uh, in, the, in the Old Testament. They were scholars. They were thorough in their studies, and they loved to be seen by men. And they weren't ashamed of it. They loved to have the best seats in the, in the, uh, uh, in the synagogues and, uh, and so forth. And, and Jesus is going to deal with these issues of the fact that our acts of righteousness can be done in such a way that edify us and build us up. They can be done in such a way as that they give glory to God. And they can be done in such a way as that we actually receive a reward in heaven. When you pray and you pray with the right motivation, Jesus says you'll receive a reward in heaven. When you give to the needy, and you do it in such a way uh, that uh, you do it for the glory of God, Jesus says you'll receive a reward in heaven. Uh, When you fast, and you show your devotion to the Lord, and you do it in secret in a way that gives God glory, Jesus says you'll receive a reward in heaven. He says, or, or you can do it and be seen by men, and that's your reward. Oh, am I? He's so spiritual. <laughs> oh, what a generous man. Oh, how, well, that was it. <laughs> Jesus says you just got your reward. Something eternal versus something very shallow. And he says we need to be careful about these things. And then he gives um, really three righteous acts. I've stretched it into four because he puts a big emphasis on forgiveness. So I want to spend a bit of time on that when we get to it. First two, as we begin... So you thought I began a few minutes ago. No, we're just now beginning. Jesus instructs us on how to properly care for the needy. Verse 2, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue, and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received the reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So uh, the pattern is the same here. First, we are to properly give to others and not be hypocrites. And if you're not familiar with uh, that term, some kind, sometimes we, uh, we get accused of being hypocrites maybe may uh, by, uh, by people that uh, are so loving and kind. They love to point those things out to us or they don't want to come to our church because after all it's full of hypocrites and you can say, that's right, why don't you join us and we'll have one more. Uh, that's probably not a witnessing tip. But uh, uh, again, uh, the English word hypocrite is just a transliteration or a pronunciation of the Greek term uh, hypocrite. And uh, in the old Greek theater, uh, when they performed, they did not act out visually if they were happy or they were sad. I'm not going to give any demonstrations. But they, uh, if you think about that, the logo or a, that you see, the eye icon sometimes for drama, it's, it's two masks. One is smiling, one is frowning. That comes from the Greek stage theater. When they ha- played a part that was sad, they would actually hold one of those masks in front of their face and then speak uh, their part. If it was another part where they were happy, same guy would then put on the happy face and, and speak. So he's speaking through a false face is the idea of a, uh, of a hypocrite. So someone who says they're very spiritual, appears to be very spiritual, and they're not is a hypocrite. The person that says, I'm just a sinner that's saved by grace, and yes, I stumble, and I don't always get it right. That is not a, that is not a hypocrite. The idea that there are sinners in the church is not being hypocritical. We're saying, yes, they're not just some. We're all <laughs> sinners in, in the church. There's nothing hypocritical about that. But if we pretend we're something that we're not, then we're hypocritical. And Jesus says, do not give to the needy like, uh, like the hypocrites. Uh, and yet this, uh, uh, this continues on. Uh, and what they did was, again, to be, be seen by men. I, I grew up in a denomination where uh, they would have big meetings uh, of their, uh, the denomination and trying to a- a- raise an annual budget. And uh, I remember as a young guy, a young teenager, overhearing a conversation in a coffee shop of uh, the leaders of this denomination planning their offering for that evening uh, where they were going to raise X amount of dollars. 
and they kind of staged it out, and brother so-and-so was going to get up front at a point in time, and he would say, I believe God's showing me there's, there's, you know, there's people here that will give $100 and so forth, and then he's going to go 500 go 1000 uh, and so forth. And then they would plan it out amongst this group of men, the leaders, who would stand up at which, at which particular time, you know, just to kind of prime the pump, you know, and kind of help people's faith a little bit. Well, as a 15-year-old, I thought this was all pretty weird. And sure enough, I'm in that meeting that night, and uh, uh, the Lord showed me, you know, there's at least five men there that are going to give $100 tonight. And there was old Brother George, you know, right on cue. Pops right, oh, praise God, what a gen-, you know, went through the whole thing. And, you know, the guy that's going to give 1000 By the way, that's how they sell timeshares as well. Uh, but, uh, 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 again, this is, this is exactly what Jesus said not to do. Don't do things, this thing in particular, giving in order to be seen by men. But he does tell us, secondly, that we can properly give to others so that it glorifies God. And the obvious thing is giving to God is to be a a, a private uh, matter. And if we, we keep it private and not to be seen by men, it can be done in such a way as to glorify God. Now, I was thinking about installing the latest technology they have to help offerings called the Tithe Vision. See, the Tithe Vision is a video camera that follows the offering plate around and then it projects it up on the screen so everybody can, <laughs> can really boost the offering. No, that's, <laughs> that's what Jesus is saying, don't do. Uh, let, let it be uh, in secret. That's why I, I don't know what anyone gives and I don't want to know what they give. So we've got to have somebody that records it, one of the guys on the board, so you get your tax letters at the end of the year because we don't want to give the IRS more than we're already giving them. Amen? <laughs> and so, uh, so we provide that information, uh, but we try to keep it as private as possible. So what you do, you'll receive a reward in heaven. Listen to what Paul says about our, our righteous acts in terms of giving in 2 Corinthians 9, 6. He says, uh, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. So uh, God loves the cheerful giver, not under compulsion. And we, obviously, we don't always see this in the body of Christ. In fact, we see, we see the opposite so much, we're almost afraid to talk about it because it's, it's so extreme uh, uh, the other way sometimes, the, the giving under com- compulsion and, and so forth. Uh, does that mean that we are to never give uh, openly? Well, no, sometimes it just uh, logistically it, it works out that way. Uh, if we have a, a sign up because we want people to give their time to set up at the ranch, we all get down there. It's pretty obvious who's there and we're all giving our time. You know, I mean, logistically, sometimes uh, we, we, we give and do things openly in terms of acts of righteousness. In the book of Acts, we remember the story of Barnabas bringing an offering from the sale of some property to give to help with this thing, the needy in particular. I think he did it with the right motivation of the heart. He did it for the glory of God because there was another couple that kind of followed him, Ananias and Sapphira. Their hearts weren't quite exactly in the right place, and so God killed them. Uh, You know, so I I would think that this is a fairly a serious (laughs) subject with the Lord, and a fear came upon the entire church, you know, and uh, we can praise God uh, that uh, that. Uh, doesn't happen any longer, at least we haven't noticed it happening, but uh, uh, nonetheless, yeah, but the point is, in this whole thing, and why I'm going to kind of drive through actually a fairly long text with several subjects this morning, is that we can get it in context, God is real concerned about our heart. Man looks on the outward, but God looks upon uh, the heart. And, um, and so, yeah, we, uh, we can do things in such a way as to bring glory to God, or we can purposely do things in such a way as to bring glory uh, to ourselves. I want to go to uh, Matthew 12, uh, verse 41 to 44, excuse me, Mark 12, 
41 to 44. And I have this for you. I, I just, it's a familiar passage. Uh, but I just to point out a couple of things that I think is very interesting here. It's the same subject matter. Verse 41 of Mark 12, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting the money into the temple treasury. Now, I just find that interesting just right off the bat. What are you going to do today? I'm going to go down and watch people give. You know, we're going to hang out right by the, uh, and, and it, again, the member of the, uh, there were offering boxes in the synagogue, offering boxes uh, in the uh, area sometimes called the court of the women or the court of the treasury, because that's where it was given. And there was that fluted metal shape above it. So when they dropped their shekels in, they were sounding the trumpets. When Jesus talks about how when they give, uh, they, they basically announce it with trumpets. He's not saying they took a little jazz band along with them, you know, played a couple of tunes and then, and then announced their offering. This is what he's speaking of. Jesus is sitting, you know, watching this scenario go down. Obviously, it's some interest to him. He says, uh, many rich people threw in large amounts, again, throwing in those, those coins, the shekels. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling the disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty, but, in, uh, but put in everything all she had to live on. So uh, God is interested in the motivation of our hearts. He also judges based on percentage, not, not total amount. The other guys put in a large total amount, but it was really nothing to them. Uh, at the same time, this woman put in, that was it. That was all she had to live on. A number of years ago when I was, uh, I was preaching at a church in, uh, in India, uh, and uh, it was kind of an interesting uh, scenario because this church had, was newly constructed. It was so new that they only had uh, four cement walls around it, still had a dirt floor, <laughs> didn't have a roof. They were praying for the roof before the rainy season came and uh, had some little lights strung up and everything. And uh, we had done an evening service there. And uh, at the end, they do their offering by having an offering box up front. They do a couple worship songs. People get up out. The women who sit separately in the back, the men who sit, they either they sit separately, men and women, either front or back or side to side. And uh, they come up and, and line up and they put their, their coins in the offering box. They weren't uh, sounding the trumpets or anything. It's just culturally, that's the way they took the offering. But what it did, as I was sitting off to the side, I saw a woman come up who I could tell by the way she was dressed was very, very poor. And when I'm talking about somebody poor in a third world country, it's poor. And, um, and I saw her put a few coins in. And, uh, and I could tell by my, uh, the other India, uh, Indian uh, pastors that were my translators that uh, they were touched and they were moved. And so it was, it reminded me of, of this situation here. And I found out later that she was in fact uh, a widow. But uh, it's an amazing thing. She wasn't doing it to be seen. We only happened to catch the glance because of uh, our location uh, up front there. Nobody else knew what she gave, but certainly what she did was a tremendous act of faith, uh, a tremendous act of trust trusting God because Paul says he can make all grace abound in you. You know, we love to sing that song. What is it about? It's about giving to the Lord. That's purely the subject matter. Uh, and sometimes uh, if we do things to be seen by men uh, and uh, that we'll miss out on that abounding grace of God, spiritual disciplines, things we do for the Lord because we love the Lord, our devotion to the Lord, and we trust the Lord. And when we act out our acts of righteousness, not to earn our salvation, but because we are saved, God uses it to build us up and strengthen us and make his grace abound in our lives. At the same time, there may be times where others notice, they see and think, praise God. That guy would have never done that before. He's tighter than I am, you know, whatever it might be. I'm speaking to myself here. Uh, the, uh, whatever it might be, uh, you know, if people see, if it's done, if the right motive, God gets the glory. And I don't know, we don't think about it much, but you actually get a reward uh, then later uh, in heaven. So Jesus instructs us on how to properly care for the needy, this idea of giving. Secondly, he instructs us on how to pray to our heavenly father, verse 5. 
And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Uh, again, he says, don't pray in a hypocritical way. Uh, don't pray because they love to pray standing in the synagogues. They love to pray on the street corners. Hey, I've just, you know, my heart's bubbling over for the Lord. Praise the God. I can't even wait to get to church. I'm just going to stop in the street corner and, uh, and, and pray right here. Uh, again, these things still uh, go on today. Uh, you've got folks that have a tendency once in a while for whatever reason to do something to draw attention uh, to themselves uh, in worship, in prayer. And Jesus says, man, it shouldn't be that way. Everything should be done in decently in order in such a way as that the focus uh, is the Lord, that he would get the glory. So he says, secondly, we are to pray in a way that glorifies God and accomplishes his purpose purposes here on earth. And I've got three principles here. This is not an all-encompassing thing about prayer, but just a couple of things to think about. The obvious, we are to primarily pray while we're alone with the Lord. We're to primarily pray when we're alone with the Lord. Uh, the idea is that if you pray in public, and that's the only time you pray, that's being a hypocrite. Because the assumption is if you're praying in public, people are assuming you've got a prayer life uh, and you know the Lord. If, if the only time you pray in public is to before others, then there, there's something missing there. This is all supposed to be based on a relationship with God uh, that you have uh, in Jesus Christ. So he says, when you pray, go into your room to pray. Uh, you don't need to be seen. After all, God the Father is not seen, and that's who you're praying to. Uh, what you do in secret, he will reward. Prayer is meant to be personal. It's supposed to be emotional. It's between you and the Lord. How, how close and intimate is it? He knows your needs before you even ask, uh, Jesus says. Peter says to cast all your cares or your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Again, uh, very, very foundational to our relationship uh, with the Lord. Spending time with the Lord, speaking to the Lord, uh, telling him what's going on in our hearts and in our lives. Yeah, he already knows. He already knows, uh, but he likes to hear it from you. He likes to hear what's, what's going on. When we pray, we are declaring our dependence uh, upon the Lord. Now, again, is it wrong then to pray uh, in public? I, I've actually heard uh, some liberal guys in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in government say, uh, quote this passage and say, therefore, there should be no public praying. We need to end this public praying that goes on, you know, especially in, re in regards to when the Senate opens and they pray and uh, in other government institutions and so forth. You know, Jesus said, like they're, you know, really intimate with the Lord. You know, Jesus said, you know, when you pray, go into your closet. It should be done in private. So that's the only time we pray. No, that's the foundational for prayer. That's the foundation for our relationship with God. Uh, but uh, praying in public, yeah, Jesus said, uh, if two or three of you agree on earth concerning any one thing, it should be done. He's talking about prayer as you come together in, uh, in, in a group. Uh, Paul talks about coming together as a church and praying in 1 Timothy. If you follow the book of Acts, you see Peter, James, and John getting uh, basically beaten for their testimony for Christ. What's the first thing they do? They got the church together and they began to pray and give glory to God and say, and make us more bold because of what's going on. They pray together as a church. Later, Peter is in prison. What was the church doing? They were gathered in a home and they were praying together. So this idea of praying in secret alone is foundational, but that's not to say that that's the only time we pray or that's the only kind of prayer that, uh, that we pray. It's not wrong, certainly, to pray uh, in public. Secondly, uh, we are to pray with a sincere heart. 
Uh, Jesus says here, don't pray in a repetitive manner. Don't keep on babbling like the pagans have a, a, a tendency to do. What's he talking about? Well, similar to what Buddhists do today, what Hindus do today. Take a short phrase. In Hinduism, they call it a mantra. You take a phrase or a couple of key words and you just say them over and over and over and over again. Now, certainly no one would take a prayer of Jesus and say it over and over and over and over and over. No, that's exactly <laughs> what's, what's happening. It's interesting that he says, don't do this. Now, let me give you a model of how to pray so that you won't do this. And then we take the model and say it over and over and over and over and over again and do the very thing uh, Jesus said not, uh, not to do. Why? There's no sincerity of heart in that. It's just by rote. It's going over something in your mind uh, over and over again. Is it wrong to memorize the Lord's Prayer? No, it's a wonderful thing to memorize the Lord's Prayer because it's a model for prayer. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But again, he's saying, get away from the vain reputation, uh, repetition. And I have to tell you, this is making a huge comeback in the church. There's a, there's a, whole, a whole group or a movement within Christianity in America now called the Emerging Church. And what, they, what they've done is they've gone back and adopted practices of the early church and by the early church, we don't talk about the book of Acts. We're talking about early Roman Catholicism within the monastic movement. So bringing back churches that never had incense and candles and robes. And I'm talking, you know, that have never had anything like that. Uh, and now adopting those things and saying and using uh, meditation methods that were done by early church leaders in order to try to earn a righteous relationship with Jesus Christ. And they've come back and now adopted these things. And many of them teach seminars on how to pick out certain phrases from the Bible, from the Psalms, about your relationship with the Lord. Memorize that phrase, that sentence, and then just say it over and over and over and over again. In fact, uh, uh, Tony Campolo is a, a name that might ring a bell. He, he promotes this idea and says he does it for 20 minutes every morning just to start his day. A repetitive prayer, what Jesus called a vain repetition. So again, we're not looking to some, well, those Pharisees, no wonder Jesus was so hard on them. Boy, what does that got to do with us? No, this is, uh, it's interesting when Jesus says, be careful, there's a reason he says it. He's not saying be careful in the first century. <laughs> He's just saying be careful uh, because we have a tendency uh, to do the very things that he's warning us uh, against. So prayer primarily should be what we do alone with the Lord. Uh, prayer should be with a sincerity of heart. And the third thing, we are to pray using a model prayer. Now, again, Jesus says, uh, these are the, he didn't say, and these are the words to use when praying. He said, this is how you should pray. pray. And so uh, there's lots of different models. You know, I, um, I get a kick out of Pastor Chuck. He says, oh, I have a model for prayer. He says, I'll just hold my hand up and, and, um, and uh, look at my thumb. And that's, the, uh, that, that's the, 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 the finger that's closest to my heart. So I start out praying with people that are close to my heart. I pray for my wife and for my family and for, uh, you know, people that are very close to me. He says, and then I, I, uh, my index finger is next. And uh, uh, those are the people that are teachers. They point their finger. So I pray for all the people that are teaching me the, the word of God. He says, then I take my middle finger, which is the tallest. And that reminds me to pray for uh, people in authority and government uh, officials because we're supposed to be praying for them. Uh, this finger, he says, uh, that's your weakest finger. Ask a piano player or a guitar player, that's your weakest finger. So I pray for those that are the weakest, those that have the greatest needs that I'm aware of. And then this finger, it's the shortest, that's me, <laughs> the weakest <laughs> of the weak. I pray for myself last. Uh, so uh, we're, we're not instituting that from now on we pray with one hand out in front of us and stare it down. At, no, it's just a model. I mean, this is, you know, it's like, well, I wish I pray for a Lord. Oh, okay, well, this reminds me of this. I'll pray for this. Well, that's, that's what the Lord's Prayer uh, meant to be here. Uh, he says, beginning, uh, pray to your Father in heaven, which again would have been a radical concept for them. God's name was holy. They would never even say it. They would never even write it uh, with vowels so that it could be, be pronounced. They would, that's why we, we just have the Y-H-V-H, and we, we add vowels and say Yahweh or whatever, but we don't really know how God's name would, say, would be pronounced because it was never pronounced. It's too holy. When they would come to it, they would just say the name. 
uh, we have that in the Old Testament, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. When they come to that word, Jews, God's name is so holy, they don't even say Lord like we do. They would say the name, Hashim. Uh, too holy. So again, you get the idea that now God, uh, Jesus says, now when you pray, pray to your, like this, our Father, and they're going to go, our Father? you got to be kidding me. I, I mean, yeah, because we're, ju- we're just all used to it, aren't we? That's how we pray, our Father who art in heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But this was a radical concept. It, was, uh, it should still be a radical concept to us because it's our Father who is in heaven. He is the king of the universe. He is the mighty ruler. He spoke creation into existence. But I can call him Father? That's how I begin my prayer. I don't memorize a phrase. I have a concept that when I pray, I'm praying to my Father that I know personally that's in heaven. And yet he is the ruler. He is the king. He is the mighty God. With that in mind, maybe he could do something there. You know, maybe I've got the faith to believe that he'll really answer this prayer because he's my Father, but he's got the power to act. Again, the second part goes with it. Remember that he is holy. Hallowed be uh, thy name. Therefore, his name, his reputation should be honored. Again, if you study Old Testament prayers, which is a very good thing to do, you'll see that those people like Nehemiah, like Ezra, like Daniel, uh, and others were very concerned about the honor of God. They were very concerned about the reputation and the name of God. What do people think about our God? Uh, and we should be concerned about that as well. And certainly uh, that has a lot then as we play for his name and his honor has to do with how I live my life since I'm, I'm named with him. I'm, I'm one of his children. Pray for his kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth uh, as it is in heaven. So I'm to pray that certainly I know his kingdom will come one day. Jesus will establish his kingdom, set up his kingdom, rule from Jerusalem. We will be coming with him uh, when he does that in terms of the, uh, being his church. But more importantly, right now, we're to be praying for his kingdom to enter people's lives. When you and I come to faith in Jesus Christ, uh, we repent of our sins, we ask to be forgiven, we bow our knee to the lordship of Christ, and we enter the kingdom of God. No one can uh, enter the kingdom of God unless he is born again, Jesus said. So we enter his kingdom. So we're praying for his kingdom to come. It's not in the by and by, one of these days this is going to happen. We're actually praying for other people to get saved for other people to come into his kingdom. This is a model prayer. I honor God. He's my father, but he's the mighty God. He is holy. Lord, and I pray for the salvation of others. Okay, we're we're beyond a a prayer that's simply memorized to say over and over again. Uh, uh, We've got some real concerns, some things that we need to be praying for. How's this? I need to pray for his kingdom to come uh, in my own life. I need to pray for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, I can tell you this, nobody questions the authority of God. Is that the way it is on earth, in my own heart? <laughs> no, I question it sometimes. Uh, and, and so I need to pray this prayer that I understand that I will really bow my own knee, that his will would be done in my own heart. And then finally, this is usually where we start. It's what I call the grocery list. Uh, pray uh, to be given your daily bread. I prefer an annual prayer for this, a biannual or even a monthly, but not daily. Uh, my needs, what's going on in my life, the Lord says, you need to come to me daily and, and present those things to me. You know, he doesn't give us the, the manna for the next week. It's just, it's just given uh, daily. And, uh, and the Lord wants us to be de- uh, dependent uh, upon him. Uh, pray to be uh, forgiven. Forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. And, uh, and Jesus is going to elaborate on this in verse 14 and 15. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll elaborate as well when we get there. Uh, and he says, pray that you will not be led into temptation, and, uh, but delivered from the evil one. I don't know if you really think about that much, but uh, man, you ought to you got to be praying for yourself and for others that, that you would not be led into temptation, that you would not fall into a trap of the enemy. Paul says in, uh, when he's talking about spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6, he, said, he says to be aware of the devil's schemes. Uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, in the Greek because he's talking about the fact that the devil has a very specific scheme to every person and even a time sequence to act it out in. 
The devil was pretty patient and he wait, as he waited on David for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And then when the time was right, boom, the scheme for David was hatched. He's on his rooftop one day, a point of weakness, not out with his men where he should have been uh, as king, but he's kind of kicked back, taking it easy, and then he happens to see Bathsheba on the roof. Satan is very patient. He has a scheme for every one of us. Uh, Jesus said to Peter that Satan asked to sift you as wheat, which is not a good thing. He says, but I have prayed for you. And he says, when you pray, pray like this. This is how you should pray. And at some point in time, you should be praying that you don't fall into sin, that you don't fall because there is an enemy that's out there who's waiting for an opportunity. So pray that you'll be delivered. God, I need your help today. I know that Satan's out there. He can use a lot of different means, Lord. Protect me, Lord. May I be a good witness for you. I need your grace upon my life. I need the power of your Holy Spirit to help me get through this day. If I'm going to be your ambassador, be a voice and be a witness for you. That's a daily prayer. That should, that should be part of our, our lives. Uh, Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored, just as it was with you, and pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. So Paul's praying for the same thing. He's following what Jesus said to do. For not everyone has faith, but the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from Satan, or from the, the evil one. These are things we need to pray. And then he concludes the prayer uh, by saying, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And that's to remind us that his kingdom means he rules over all. His power, he can do anything. And his glory, he alone is worthy of all glory that we can give him. So Jesus instructs us on how to properly care for the needy, or give, or give alms. He instructs us on how to pray to our heavenly Father, And then three, he instructs us on the priority of forgiveness. And we see this in verses 14 and 15. But if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I say that makes it kind of a priority, you know, based on what Jesus said uh, right there. And it's a big issue, isn't it? Um, uh, you know, I could do a show of hands. How many of you struggle with forgiveness? <laughs> yeah. It's easy to, you know, it's easy to forgive some people, you know, uh, people we love or close to us. Uh, other people, it's more, it's more difficult to, to forgive. It's more difficult to forgive in degree, in degree because of what's, what's happened to us. If you were sexually molested as a child, it would be very difficult to forgive that person. Are, are we talking forgiveness now? We're not talking somebody that cut you off on the freeway. There, there are different degrees in terms of, of difficulty in forgiveness. And, and this is the world that we live in. We just watch the news. And uh, there's radical things. There's horrific things that happen to believers every day. And Jesus says this is a critical issue, this whole idea of, of, of forgiveness. And, um, and we could spend the next uh, 10 weeks just, just talking about the, the issue. But... Uh, but this all has to do with the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus is very concerned about what's in our heart. Uh, and if there's a lack of forgiveness towards someone, he says, then you will not be forgiven. Uh, those are pretty powerful words. I, I, I know that he is not talking about uh, eternal life. Uh, he's not saying that we earn God's grace based on how well we forgive others. Uh, when we come to faith in, in, in uh, Christ, our sins are forgiven. Uh, even sins like this that we can carry with us, they're still forgiven. But I think his point is very important. It's a priority because it affects our relationship with God. Because it's, it's a sin. Uh, any sin that we carry around in our life that, we've, that we can either justify, because uh, I'm special and I've got my rights, and if you knew me, then, you know, you, uh, or, or we just ignore it and uh, we put it somewhere else in our minds and put it on the back burners. Uh, we can do a lot of things, and if we carry that around with us, Jesus says, in terms of forgiving us, uh, again, because we have a positional righteousness in Christ. When we come to faith in Christ, God imputes to us, he gives to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's why we're going to spend eternity with him one day. There's also not just a positional, but a very practical righteousness. That's how we live our lives. 
Uh, and, uh, and we all sin. We say we have not sinned. We've deceived ourselves and the truth is, uh, is not in us, uh, John says. Uh, these are the day-to-day things that we struggle with until we are with the Lord one day. And one of those things we struggle with is this idea of forgiveness. So uh, it's a priority. Secondly, it's a priority to forgive so that we will be forgiven. Um, and I want to uh, have you turn to Matthew uh, 18 over a couple of pages. I'm going to read a pretty lengthy passage, too long to put up on a, on a PowerPoint slide. It's um, one that you may be familiar with. And then I want to come back and, and try to give you a couple of practical things based on what Jesus said, based on what he says here in uh, one other passage in dealing with this issue. If you struggle with it, and I'm going to assume that's a, that's a lot of us that struggle with this at different times in our, in our lives. And if, um, uh, again, Paul, remember, talks about a root of bitterness that can come into our hearts. Because when you don't forgive, eventually you become bitter, and then it's like a taproot that goes down, and it can, can really lock in. The longer it goes, the more difficult it can be. And again, the point is, it's a priority because it affects our relationship with the Lord, uh, and we're going to see with others as well. Matthew uh, 18, verse 21 Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. And you have to realize that uh, Peter is really matured in the Lord, and he wants Jesus to know it. Because initially, if somebody did something against Peter, he'd probably pop him right there, you know. So not only is he going to forgive him once or twice or three, he wants Jesus to know he'd forgive the guy seven seven times. So he wants Jesus to know just how spiritual he is. And he's about ready to get, of course, blown out of the water by Jesus. Verse 22, Jesus answers, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. And he gives an illustration. Uh, And I know we're familiar with it, but try to stick with me as we go through here. There's a couple of things that are important. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. You need to know uh, that was like millions and millions of dollars. This man could have never paid it. If he worked his whole life, it was impossible for him to pay the debt. And obviously, that's, that's our debt in terms of sin. We could have never uh, earned our way in terms of a relationship with God. Verse 25, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Uh, The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But, there's a contrast, but when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. That's a couple of pennies. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Glad he doesn't, you know, get too enthusiastic about this. Uh, Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And then Jesus says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother in your heart. We're not talking about salvation. We are talking about what happens in terms of our fellowship with the Lord. It's a priority that we forgive. A model prayer that we would probably be do well to go through and pray through daily includes forgiving others because we've been forgiven. That, that's, that's the point here. God has forgiven us so much, we should forgive others. Uh, it affects our relationship with the Lord. And notice verse 31, when the other servants saw what had happened, they became greatly distressed. When other people saw how much this man had been forgiven, and then they saw how he treated somebody that owed him so little and refused to forgive, other people were greatly distressed about that. Uh, Jesus says it affects our relationship with him, 
It stumbles other people that are watching our lives when they realize we're a Christian and all of our sin has been forgiven by God and we refuse to forgive a particular sin against someone else. It affects our relationship with the Lord. It affects our witness to others. And uh, the third thing is that it grieves the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, Paul says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. Again, these things are associated with a lack of forgiveness. Brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. So if you struggle with this, I think here's, here's what Jesus is trying to teach us. We should try to, in the midst of it, just be honest with the Lord. We're back to that cast your anxiety, your cares on him because he cares for you. Prayer is personal. He knows what's going on in your heart even before you ask. So just say, I'm struggling in this area with a forgiveness because of this situation. I mean, he knows, but just tell him and admit it. A confession of sin is good. It helps help cleanse, cleanse the, the heart. And uh, confess him what's going on. Tell him that you need your help. And then try to meditate on the fact that of all the things that he has forgiven you, that, that certainly is the point of the story and the parable. We've been given so much and compared to how little uh, that he's asking us to forgive others. It's not that it's a little thing. Uh, you know, the wrong that's been done to us, it's not that it's a little thing. It's only little in the comparison of, of everything the Lord's forgiven us and everything that he gives us in terms of eternal life and a relationship. It's, it's not, uh, Jesus or, or God is never trying to belittle what you feel in your heart and what you're going through. That, don't misunderstand that. It's just in comparison to, in terms of a contrast. Uh, that's a good thing to do. And I, I think... Uh, uh, you know, realize that it's an act of, of the will. You know, previously, Jesus told us to love our enemies. Well, you know, if we liked them, they wouldn't be our enemies, right? <laughs> so you, you, you realize you can love somebody and not really like them? In other words, it's an act of the will. I can choose to act lovingly towards someone, even if I don't really like them. Because if I liked them, they wouldn't be my enemies, all right? <laughs> so I think that, that's clear to understand. It's an act of the will, not my emotions, uh, my emotions may follow later, it may not. Reconciliation with them may follow later, it may not. Uh, forgiveness is not reconciliation. Joseph forgave his brothers. They were not recon- reconciled for about 12 or 14 years. So these things are, are two very different things. It's good to sep- separate those. G- uh, Joseph could forgive his brothers, but he could not be reconciled until they repented. That's why when he saw them, he didn't reveal himself to them. He hides the silver in their sacks to find out what's in their heart. Then he hears them. This is being done to us because of what we did to our brothers. It was wrong. It was wrong. He needed to hear that. These guys are broken. They've repented. So now he takes steps to see reconciliation. He reveals himself and in the process uh, ends up bringing his family and Jacob. They all come to Egypt and everything's great. Uh, and then Joseph dies. They take him back. They bury him uh, with his forefathers there in the land that God gave them uh, in Israel. And then when they all get back to Egypt, the brothers are going, he's going to kill us now. <laughs> he just did. As long as dad was alive, we had a shot at this, you know, but dad's gone. He just did this uh, honor our dad. He'll kill us now for sure. And then, and then Joseph says this, this classic line, Genesis 50, 20, what you meant for evil, God meant for good for the saving of many lives. So here's the third part of how could Joseph, that's the other thing, read about Joseph's life. He is the type of Christ in terms of forgiveness in the Old Testament. Uh, And he is able to realize that they sold me into slavery, but God allowed it to happen. This person said this, did this, and it was a horrific, but God allowed it to happen. And if God allowed it to happen, he must have had a reason. I don't see it. I don't understand it. It's a, it's a kind of a faith issue. So I have to look at the character of God and say, if he allowed this to happen, it's got to be for a purpose in such a way, if I do this right, God could really get the glory for it. There was just a, a, a great scene, and I don't want to belabor this too much, but a real great contemporary example. We talked about the, the folks who were shot at the New Life Church in Colorado Springs, the YWAMers uh, that we were praying for that very Sunday morning when this was being dealt out, and we all watched it later on the national 
national news. What we didn't get to see, what wasn't covered on the national news, is that the following Sunday, the following Sunday, the parents of the kids that were killed came to New Life Church there in Colorado Springs, and the parents of the shooter came, who are believers, a solid evangelical uh, 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 family this kid came from. They all came, and they showed up, not knowing what to expect for sure, but they came so the parents uh, who lost their, their sons and daughters could say, we forgive you and we love you in the name of Jesus Christ. It was a very moving, moving thing. Probably saw that on CNN. I think they carried it all live. No, I think they missed that part. I think they just got the shooting at the church, but they kind of missed the real story. Because he can make all grace abound. And God got the glory for it. The people that saw it, the people that were there, the people that heard about it. It was later, they were interviewed and were on Focus on the Family. And that was broadcast uh, uh, just recently. And God got the glory when he can get in and go beyond what we are capable of doing on a human level. Because we serve our Father that we know, who is in heaven, who spoke creation into existence. He hardwired us. He made us. He knows how to heal us and how to fix us. And he says, when you don't forgive and you carry it with you, you're going to create some real problems for yourself. It doesn't really, it doesn't really hurt the other person. Have you noticed that? <laughs> they seem to be go right on their merry way. But it can really affect us and our relationship with the Lord, our witness to others, and grieving the Holy Spirit. Joseph is a great example uh, to study. Four, and we're going to do this quickly because I know you've got this fasting thing wired. So uh, we don't need to spend a lot of time on that. Jesus instructs us on the purpose of being discreet when fasting. Verse 16 to 18, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces and show men that they are fasting. So when I look like that, it's because I have the flu. It's not because I'm fasting. I probably should mention that. Because Pastor Tim, your face looks pretty disfigured quite often. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you're fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So again, the purpose of spiritual disciplines, fasting being one of them, should never be to impress others. But Jesus says, be careful because that's going to be our tendency. Uh, again, the Jews only fasted one day a year, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, but the Pharisees uh, twice a week, Monday and Thursday, and they prided themselves uh, in doing that. Secondly, the purpose of spiritual discipline should be to impress God, not people, but God with our love and our devotion to him. So therefore, uh, when you fast and you're praying to the Lord on something very specifically, uh, you get so busy uh, <clears throat> Uh, in your relationship with the Lord, you forget to eat one day? Well, praise the Lord, you know, but the, <laughs> you, you don't need to tell anyone, you know, about it. It looks slimmer to you? Well, there's a reason, you know. <laughs> you know, the telephone, oh, I can't go out to dinner. I'm fasting right now, actually. You know, it, it's, we don't need to go there because then we get no reward and it does nothing for us spiritually. Let me close with this Warren Worsby quote. He says, we substitute reputation for character. Mere words for true prayer. Money for the devotion of the heart. No wonder Jesus compared the Pharisees to tombs that were whitewashed on the outside, but filthy on the inside. But hypo hypocrisy not only robs us of character, it robs us of spiritual rewards. Instead of the eternal approval of God, we receive the shallow praise of men. We pray, but there's no answer. We fast, but the inner man shows no improvement. The spiritual life becomes hollow and lifeless. We miss the blessings of God here and now and also lose the reward of God when Christ returns. Spiritual disciplines. God's concerned about our hearts. There's a way to give and honor God. There's a way to pray and honor God and get his purposes done. There's a way to practice spiritual disciplines. Uh, they're going to have an impact on our lives and build us up. We'll more fully receive God's grace in our lives and be able to be the witnesses for him that we want to be. And on top of that, <laughs> there's a reward uh, in heaven. Uh, or we can do it for the, hey, way to go. That was really good. The praise of men. One's eternal, one's pretty shallow. And Jesus says, so be careful.
dark You calm my fearful heart I will rest in you You give me perfect peace You fill my deepest need I will rest in you Shining like the sun Let your kingdom come Wanna be with you In your presence I'm here to give you praise You take my breath away And now I'm here with you in your presence You guide me through the dark You calm my fearful heart I will rest in you You give me perfect peace you fill my deepest need I'll rest in you God Shining like the sun Let your kingdom come I want to be with you In your presence I'm here to give you praise You take my breath away And now I'm here with you In your presence Your kindness draws me in Now I'm with you once again I will rest in you My God who reigns on high To you alone I cry I will rest in you God shining like the sun God shining like the sun let your kingdom come I want to be with you In your presence I'm here to give you With our faith I'm letting go Trust I'm holding on The substance of Your hope and 